from Washington, D.C., this is Middle East Focus. Hello and welcome to Middle East Focus, a weekly podcast on regional affairs and U.S. policy produced by the Middle East Institute in Washington, D.C. I'm Alistair Taylor, MEI's editorial director. On today's program, we'll be discussing the talks between longtime regional rivals, Saudi Arabia and Iran. Since they began in early April, several rounds of talks between Riyadh and Tehran have now been held in Baghdad. They're taking place amid a broader regional trend towards deconfliction, and as negotiations in Vienna over the revival of the 2015 Iran nuclear deal appear to have bogged down. You can subscribe to Middle East Focus on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and other podcast providers, as well as our Arabic language program, Podcast al Ausat hosted by MEI senior fellow Ibrahim al Asl. Next up, Banafshe Kainush, the author of the book Saudi Arabia and Iran, Friend or Foes, and a regular contributor to MEI, will be talking to two regional experts, Mohammed al-Sulami and Kasra Arabi, about what Riyadh and Tehran are looking to get out of the talks and how they see things playing out moving forward. Mohammed al-Sulami is the founder and president of the International Institute for Iranian Studies, Rasana, in Riyadh, Kasra Arabi is a non-resident scholar with MEI's Iran program and an analyst in the Extremism Policy Unit at the Tony Blair Institute for Global Change in London, where he works on Iran and Shia Islamist extremism. It is my pleasure to welcome you to today's podcast and to host you for the weekly regional affairs episode on the latest Saudi-Iran talks. Since the establishment of their formal friendship ties in 1929, Saudi Arabia and Iran have severed relations three times, only to recognize subsequently that their ties needed to be urgently repaired. As we know, Saudi Arabia last broke its ties off with Iran in 2016, after Iranian mobs attacked the Saudi embassy in Tehran and its consulate in Mashhad. Now, with the ongoing talks, Iran sounds more optimistic about the prospects of its relations with Saudi Arabia. Riyadh says the talks are friendly and sincere, but exploratory at this stage. So let me ask my first question and ask you both to briefly respond. What's so important or different about these talks? Mohammed, why don't you please go first and then Kasra? All right, thank you, Banafsha, and thank you for MRI and for Alyssa for having me today. It is uh, indeed a very important topic, and I think it's very hot discussion uh, across the region and beyond. Why these two rounds of talks are important, I think they are important because it is very healthy first and helpful for both sides to talk to each other and try to understand uh, issues clearly and directly. Before uh, these four rounds of talks, there were some attempts from regional players and uh, international players to deliver messages between Riyadh and Tehran. And now we have these direct talks. So these rounds of talks, I think, are so different also because they do not come under the ministries of foreign affairs in both countries. We know that both delegations, I would say, or people who come from Saudi Arabia and uh, Iran to meet in Baghdad, come from a security background or military background. So that is something different. Uh, And that gives the idea about the process of such round of talks if they proceed. So as we know so far, there is uh, no serious achievement and the cautious and testing of the water, as they call it, is the main factor. Yet, if there is no breakthrough, I would think uh, the gap of uh, distrust between the two players will be widening. I hope uh, not the case, and I hope they find uh, a common ground for uh, going uh, to the next stage. We haven't been there, and as the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Saudi Arabia explained or described, it is a discovering uh, stage, and we try to find ways of uh, moving forward. Well, thank you for verifying that important piece of information that the conversation between the two is indeed focused on security issues and for that important perspective. Castro, what are your thoughts on this? Sure. Thank you, Banafsha. And uh, firstly, thank you for inviting me to to speak on this important topic. So I think to follow on from what Mohammed was was saying there's also you know these talks are taking place against the backdrop of the 
nuclear talks in Vienna around whether Iran is going to come back to the nuclear negotiating table. And the Iranians thus far have basically realized that the US is, well, the US has said this openly as well, that it is firmly committed to re-entering the 2015 nuclear agreement. And that's that's shaped Iran's calculus. Um, certainly the, the Islamic Republic now believes that really it can, because of this commitment that the Biden administration has given to re-entering the deal, that it can perhaps both use intimidation and as well as you know, diplomatic engagement to gain more concessions from the West without really facing any consequences. And why are these Iran-Saudi talks also important? I think, well, again, from the Iranian perspective, this is probably for the first time in, in 42 years since the Islamic Revolution that there is now a US administration that really has no appetite to stay in the Middle East. The Iranians believe quite like others, that the Biden administration has, has really bound itself by the ending the forever war slogan. The Iranians have been closely monitoring Afghanistan and learning the, the lessons that actually the Biden administration has quite a high threshold to implement this, this ending the forever war slogan. So I think these, these two issues on, against the backdrop of these these Iran-Saudi talks are also worth considering, and they will also factor into certainly the Iranian calculus. Castro, thank you for that viewpoint, uh, and particularly the case that you made that the United States does play a pivotal role in the forwarding to, to some extent of the Saudi-Iran talks. So my next question is to Mohammed. What does Saudi Arabia want from these talks? And is the kingdom prepared to engage with Iran mindful of the the fact that the United States may or may not be as committed to the region? Yeah, I think uh, there is no doubt that Saudi Arabia to establishing a stable region on all levels. That is, I think, very important, especially if we take in consideration the ambitious vision, Saudi 2030, which is based on uh, economic growth, engagement, zero problem if they can approach to uh, with the neighbors and taking the whole region to a new uh, chapter in its history. As you know, just yesterday we had in Riyadh the Green Middle East Initiative. And today we have, uh, while we are talking maybe, Future Investment Initiative uh, just kicked off to, uh, you know, uh, in Riyadh, of course, based in Riyadh with the uh, participation from uh, different uh, leaders of the world, investors and uh, decision makers and uh, experts. So that gives you the idea why Saudi is keen to talk to Iran. And of course, we shouldn't forget, as I mentioned in my, in my latest article for MRI, that uh, there was an initiative from the Iraqi side, from the prime minister of Iraq, Mustafa Al-Khadmi, that uh, ask the Saudi to have these rounds of talks with the Iranian in Baghdad. And that, as I said, it has its own uh, domestic, of course, politics. Uh, I'm talking about the Iraq, uh, Iraqi uh, case. So that was just before the, uh, the elections. Well, you bring up a couple of important points. One is the need for regional integration that seems to be on every country's mind, uh, given that they all more or less have development visions of their own that they'd like to share with neighbors as well. So I'd like to turn to Kasra and ask you, what do you think Iran wants from these talks? The first thing I think is important to take a step back and view the Islamic Republic's broader objectives and see how these talks fit within them. And to look at what Ayatollah Khamenei has been saying. So for more than two decades, Khamenei has asserted that the Islamic revolution is not complete. And in the late 1990s, he outlined five stages of the Islamic revolution. One, the revolution, which they've achieved. Two, an Islamic regime. Three, an Islamic state four, an Islamic society, and five, an Islamic civilization and order. So according to Khamenei and his close, close hardline circle, such as Ayatollah Alamul Huda, who is Raisi's father-in-law, Iran has been stuck on the third stage. And Raisi has been groomed and been brought up, de facto appointed president, to change this 
to achieve the third stage so they can focus on achieving an Islamic society and later an Islamic civilization. And this is actually something that Hojatul Islam Haji Sadiqi, Khamenei's representative to the IRGC, said that Raisi has been brought on so that we can move on to the next stages of the revolution. Now, a big barrier to that final goal, achieving an Islamic order or an Islamic civilization, is the presence of the US and the West in the Middle East. So for Khamenei, the presence of the US is a barrier, is a constraint to the Hezbollahization of the Middle East. So against that backdrop, as I said, for the first time in 42 years, the Iranians believe there is now a US administration that has no appetite to stay in the Middle East bound by the forever war slogan. And they looked very closely at Afghanistan and how that was dealt with. They believe that so long as they provide the right framing for the US to exit, that perhaps this can occur in the Middle East. So where I see it from Tehran's perspective, the exaggeration of progress in the talks, I think is actually aimed as a tactical move aimed at really giving the Biden administration the kind of framing it needs to withdraw from the Middle East. Namely, we've sold Iran Saudi, we're no longer needed. And Tehran has been very clever. It's made, it's made full use of both their informal and formal support networks in the region and in, in the West to pump out this narrative of real progress in the talks. So Tehran has been closely monitoring what senior members of the Biden team have said before and during the presidency. There's this idea that, you know, resolving the Middle East is down to getting Iran and Saudi to the table and that they must resolve their problems between themselves. And it's in both their interests to to do so. And once that's done, the US can withdraw. So really, in effect, I think that the Iranians are, by exaggerating the progress in the talks, being very vocal about it, unlike the Saudis, they're in effect trying to provide the Biden administration with this kind of framing. And at the same time, exaggerating progress also boxes in Saudi, because if the Saudis do not respond in the same way, at least externally in front of the media, in front of the public, it looks as though they are being the non-cooperative actor. And I think part of this problem is the Western understanding of the root of the Islamic Republic's hostility towards Saudi Arabia. You know, the conventional view, the conventional Western view tends to look at the Iran-Saudi problem as a very real politic tussle between two great regional powers or a Persian versus Arab rivalry. And I think this is a misreading of how Iran's hardline elite and their core support base view Saudi Arabia. And when I'm talking about the hardline elite, I'm not talking about people like Zarif, as far as the inner circle are concerned. Zarif is just a PR person. I'm talking about the core inner, inner circle topped by the Beta Ahbari, the Supreme Leader's office, as well as the hardline clergy and the Revolutionary Guard. For them, they view Saudi Arabia and the House of Saud, the Allah Sauds, as a very ideological issue in a very ideological way. And it really goes back to what the founder of the Islamic Revolution, Ayatollah Khomeini, said from the offset, the view that Saudi Arabia is an illegitimate Western-backed monarchy over the holy lands of Mecca and Medina. Even at the more extreme end of the spectrum, You see the IRGC claiming the Al Sauds are, quote, Jewish, and they are seeking to destroy Islam from within. So the Raisi administration, so the Raisi presidency, which, again, the IRGC is its main foundation, is very much from this hardline base that has this view. And even in the past few years, Raisi himself has said, quote, the Al Saud is not just an incompetent regime, but an evil devil-like movement that has shamelessly committed crimes in Yemen, Syria, Iraq, and Bahrain, end quote. So as far as the Islamic Republic is concerned, hostility towards Saudi Arabia is ideological, and I think that is here to stay. If you really want to see the true colors of the regime towards Saudi and the Gulf states, ask them a question about the warming of ties between the Arab states and Israel. And that's where this ideological sentiment really comes out. So it's not really just this narrative, even on the practical level. If we look at the talks, as the talks are ongoing, we're still seeing the Iran-backed Houthis firing missiles towards Saudi. Just two weeks ago, there there was an attack. So as far as Iran is concerned, I actually believe this is a tactical move. I think For the Islamic Republic, these talks are more about PR than any substantive policy change. And the PR is about giving the US 
the right framing to withdraw from the Middle, uh, Middle East. Because that's the immediate priority for Ayatollah Khamenei. From his perspective, that's what will enable Iran to move to the next stages of the Islamic revolution with the end goal of creating this Islamist order and Hezbollahizing the Middle East further. You raise a number of very comprehensive viewpoints, and I really appreciate it. Um, One of the things that came to my mind as you were speaking, by way of wrapping up the very important topics that you mentioned, is the role that the United States plays in all of this and Iran's desire to somehow convince or not convince the United States about one course of action or another. If we remember during the nuclear talks, Iran kind of overplayed its cards and optimism as well, only to find out later that a lot depends on what the United States decides to do or not to do in the region. Now, before going to my next question, which has to do about U.S. intentions and in relationship to Iran's nuclear file, I want to give Mohammed a moment to hear his reflections of maybe about some of the issues that Castro raised. Mohammed, could you please very briefly let us know your thoughts here? Well, uh, I mostly agree with Castro and what uh, he was saying in terms of the Iranian tension or this, the Iranian strategy in terms of the uh, rounds of talk with Saudi Arabia. We have been, of course, monitoring Iranian newspapers and news agencies and the statements from uh, leaders and officials. We used to do this kind of language they are using against Saudi Arabia. Uh, we think most of those terms that uh, has the enmity in it against Saudi Arabia has a domestic uh, consumption and regional consumptions uh, w- within the followers of Iran, especially the non-state actors and militias uh, across the region from Lebanon north to Yemen in the south. Uh, and that is uh, try to send a message to those people. But uh, at the same time, if we look at, the, for example, in the uh, Iranian constitution, we find this language is uh, in the core of the Iranian constitution. So whether the exporting the revolution, whether the uh, creating funding and training the uh, militias across the regional non-state actors in general. So uh, sometimes uh, those language they use in their statements, which is very negative against Saudi Arabia and regional countries, have its own roots in the whole, the nation of the regime, I would say. But we look mostly uh, at what they are doing more than what they are saying, whether positive or negative. If they say uh, negative things and their actions are different, that is okay for with, with the regional countries. That is, we'll take it as a you know domestic consumptions and not uh, the reality of the regime or the foreign policy of the regime toward the regional countries. But if it's matching w- with the actions, the ground, that means this is the whole political system, whether the leaders whether the military people or the government members have the same ideology and therefore their foreign policy is in parallel with the ideology. And then it is the ideology that is leading the foreign policy and not the other way around. So regardless of the going in details in terms of the statements or negative statements from the Khamenei or other leaders or other, uh, I mean, officials in Iran, we are waiting for positive actions, even if they keep the, the negative uh, terms or statements. We really don't care about the statements because they will stay as statements and doesn't harm us. And that will represent the reality of the regime more than anything. But we want a, a real positive actions on the ground. Well, that's very interesting. And I want to thank you both for these uh, two important narrative perspectives. This brings me to a final question. To both of you, to what extent do you think that success in these talks will depend on the outcome of Iran's nuclear file? Mohammed, why don't you please go first? Thank you. Well, I think Saudi sees things differently. From an Iranian perspective, these issues are very tightly linked due to the fact that regional countries, including Saudi Arabia, have their own concerns over the Iran's nuclear deal and the way it was drafted without P5 plus one taken consideration 
the uh, GCC countries' concerns. Uh, of course, since 2013, Iran miscalculated, I would say, the possible result of the nuclear negotiations without any attempt to talk to neighboring countries. Iran, in my opinion, uh, and Iran leadership, I would mainly deeply believe if Tehran reaches an agreement with the great power, regional countries, especially GCC countries, cannot do anything and have no choice but to follow. And this, unfortunately, one of the problem of Iran understanding and attitude to the neighborhood. And I think Iran has to revisit this image and the way they look at their neighbors. So we now know that many people in Iran and the Iranian political system uh, reached the conclusion that such policy was a big mistake. And now the way back to DC goes through GCC capital cities, especially Riyadh. When then the question arising is that, is Iran serious in those talks? Although they understood there are miscalculus before, I think it uh, depends on the outcome of these talks. So far, there is no breakthrough at all in the, in the four rounds of talks between Saudi Arabia and Iran. And I think Saudi believes that talks for talks doesn't help. Giving the promises of implementing those talks on the ground also complicate the problem. Building the trust between the two sides, in my opinion, is the main obstacles. And now, if both countries go beyond things and beyond what they are discussing, things will be much easier. To conclude in this regard, Saudi wants uh, to solve the problem with Iran. And it is, I would say it is one-sided problem uh, for the fact that Saudi doesn't attack Iran, Saudi doesn't have militias, Saudi have not been firing any missiles or drones against Iran or Iranian cities. But at the same time, we are receiving um, Iranian missiles, drones, and militias from South and North. So I think Saudi wants a new Iran, a state, the, the state, not a revolution. If Iran moves from a revolutionary status to a, a normal state, I think things will be easier to solve with, and uh, problem will be easier to be solved with Iran. If not, tactical moves wouldn't help a lot. And I think that will backfire to Iran and its relation with the neighboring countries. Thank you very much for that response. And Castro, back to you. How much do you think that these talks will hinge on the outcome of the nuclear talks with Iran? Sure. And, you know, I think for the, as far as the Iranians are concerned, uh, as far as the Islamic Republic is concerned, they're, they're not in a rush to go back to the table. In part, what they're actually doing is, is escalating. So this escalation is born out of a belief that they can intimidate the West through nuclear escalation, as well as regional escalation via its proxies to gain more concessions from, from the US. At the same time, however, the Iranians are also very aware that there are calls in DC to expand the nuclear talks to include Iranian destabilization. So in a sense, the, the direct talks as a tactical move ticks that box as well. You know, it says, sends out the message that actually we're resolving our problems between our, ourselves and the nuclear talks are about the nuclear. So that's where I see the talks fitting into the outcome of the nuclear nuclear file. I think off the back of what Mohammed has just said, and he raised a really, really important point about practical changes. I think the key questions to ask about whether these talks are actually going to produce any practical changes is to ask the question, is the Guts Force, is the Revolutionary Guard in the region on the retreat, or is it expanding? Secondly, is the Islamic Republic, is the regime becoming more or less ideological? In relation to the first question, I don't see any evidence the Guts Force footprint across the Middle East is, is being reduced. In relation to the second, it's quite clear since Raisi's, well, with the bringing of Raisi into the presidency, that the Islamic Republic wants to become more ideological, is becoming more ideological. Mehdi Tayeb, who's in the very, very, on the inside, um, a close insider of Khamenei, he said that we've reached the time to purify the Islamic revolution. And we see this, you know, the Khamenei and his, his hardline circle view, for example, the Revolutionary Guard as the Sutuna Khaimeh Engalab, which is the main pillar of the Islamic revolution. And we see that 
it's the IRGC is the foundation of this RACI administration. You've got IRGC affiliates and IRGC members entrenched within the, the key ministries, as well as making up many of the 874 political appointee positions that RACI gets to nominate. So asking those two key questions tells us a lot about whether these talks are actually going to, to lead to any meaningful change or whether it's more a tactical move for Tehran aimed at really giving the right framing to the US to withdraw from the Middle East. Well, it is an uncertain time and future for the Saudi-Iran ties. And thank you so much to our guests, Mohammed and Kasra. I hope you enjoyed that as much as I did. Thank you to our listeners for joining us for today's episode. And special thanks to our podcast editor, Meredith McCleary, and MEI's entire communications team. That was Banafshe Kanush talking to Mohammed Al Sulami and Kasra Arabi. You can follow all of MEI's coverage of the talks, Saudi Arabia and Iran, on our website at www.mei.edu. That's all the time we have this week. Thank you to our listeners for tuning in and to our production team. You can follow MEI on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube, and subscribe to our email newsletters for the latest analysis and information about upcoming events. I'm Alistair Taylor. We will see all of you next week. This has been a presentation of the Middle East Institute. To support MEI's programs and podcasts, please donate at www.mei.edu. Thank you for your support.